Good afternoon and thank you all for coming out this afternoon and for the continued coverage. Today I have most members of our team that you normally see. Uh, some are actually in Lake Charles uh, this afternoon. They'll be coming back tonight. Uh, but I also have today John Spain, who's the Executive Vice President of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. And he'll speak in just a moment uh, and talk about some ways that people can donate to very worthy causes associated with Hurricane Laura recovery and relief. Uh, and I do want to say at the outset how grateful I am and people all across Louisiana are for all of the assistance we're getting from outside the state, but also from here in the state, various uh, corporations. Uh, we know the faith-based community stepped up, uh, generous individuals, you, you name it. A lot of people are really digging deep in order to help the people who've, who've uh, been so uh, terribly impacted by the storm. We appreciate it. I did have a unified command group meeting earlier today that began with a briefing from the National Weather Service. Um, and what I want to say at the outset of, of this conference is uh, the weather remains a real challenge, not in terms of a storm, but it's the heat. The heat and humidity today across Louisiana, but particularly in the affected communities, the heat index is going to be between 105 and 108. Um, and, and this is going to extend for the next few days. We do think we'll get some, some relief on the humidity side, but the temperatures are going to remain very high. Uh, and with people working to clean up, without there being uh, adequate water service in some areas, uh, certainly not the air conditioning and so forth, it is imperative that people, uh, first of all, pace themselves, take frequent breaks, and make sure that they don't get overheated. Uh, it wouldn't take much for people to have a heat um, stroke or huffer, uh, suffer heat exhaust, exhaustion in, in weather like this. Uh, we do not have uh, any additional confirmed fatalities to report today that are storm related. Um, so we are still at 14. That's very tragic and very sad. I encourage you to continue to lift those families up in your prayers. But it is still worth mentioning that eight of the 14 are carbon monoxide poisoning. So we need people to be very safe and cautious when they run a generator, do it in accordance with the instruction manual that comes with the generator. Make sure you keep it outside at least 20 feet away from the house and not right outside of a window or close to a door. You don't want it in a crawl space or a garage or even a carport. Um, and and uh, if you feel it all, uh, faint or dizzy or lightheaded, uh, make sure that you get to fresh air immediately because it's colorless and it's odorless, um, the, the carbon monoxide, and you won't know that, that it's happening to you sometimes until uh, it's too late. So be very careful with that. The other thing we've been asked to, to tell people is make sure you don't f refill the fuel of a generator until it's uh, while it's hot. So make sure that you let it stop running for a while, uh, cool down, and then refuel. Did want to talk a little bit about the Corps of Engineers, and we have Colonel Murphy here, who, who commands the New Orleans District of the Corps. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, for being with us today. Uh, FEMA has issued a mission assignment to the Corps for the Blue Roof program. You've, you've seen this in Louisiana uh, before, um, but it is, it is incredibly important, uh, this temporary roofing. Uh, you know, they're going to bring in uh, subject matter experts, and, and they already have a management cell on the ground in the affected area of Louisiana. They're deploying additional assets in the coming days to support uh, mission requirements. There's some things that they have to do in order to execute. One is they're going to have to collect right of entry uh, information, um, and homeowners are going to have to assign the right of entry to allow them to be able to do the uh, inspection. Uh, and the work if they, if they in fact, are uh, candidates for the Blue Roof program. And if so, they'll put the temporary roof up. Now, this is available in the, in the six parishes that also have uh, clearance right now from Pima for individual assistance. So this is going to start off at least initially, and it may, it may in the future uh, grow from here, but it's going to start off in Cameron, Calcasieu, Jefferson Davis, Beauregard, Allen, and Vernon Parishes. To sign up, the public can go to www.usace.army.gov. 
mil slash blue roof. The public will also be able to sign up via the blue roof hotline at 1888 roof blue. That's R O O F dash B L U. So that's 1888 766 3258. This program is free to the public and it is a very essential part of our overall emergency housing plan because there's going to be some number, some percentage of residences that can be made safe, secure, and habitable uh, with this temporary roof. And, and that's a family that doesn't need to be sheltered somewhere else. And that's a family that gets to stay in their home, uh, which is what the vast majority of families want to do. Uh, we we uh, have, still have extensive power outages across the state. They have uh, been reduced since yesterday. We're currently at about 324,000 across the state. Uh, I do believe that the vast majority of outages in central and north Louisiana are going to come up over the next two to three days, and they're making steady progress, uh, it seems, almost by the hour right now. But the damage to the grid infrastructure in southwest Louisiana, really extending from Cameron Parish up uh, to Vernon or so, is, is very extensive, uh, and especially in Calcasieu. Uh, so, so I just had a meeting with Intergy and the uh, Intergy uh, Louisiana uh, president, uh, and, and I will tell you that, uh, that they're working extremely hard. Um, but the fact of the matter is in the Calcasieu area, probably looking at about three weeks or so before some of those communities start powering up. And they're going to be given regular updates uh, because they want the, the public to know about the progress and, and what kind of timelines we're looking at. But, but that's what President Philip May uh, shared with me earlier. Uh, we still have 17,000 line crews from outside the state, not crews, crewmen. So 17,000 individuals who, who are from out of the state of Louisiana who are working in our state to restore power. And as those crews complete their work in different parts of the state, they will be collapsing onto the southwest Louisiana area. Uh, the National Guard uh, remains fully activated with just under 6,200 guardsmen activated uh, in support of Hurricane Laura. Uh, recovery efforts. They have distributed uh, more than 1.3 million liters of water, uh, almost 800,000 MREs, more than 100,000 bags of ice, and almost 20,000 tarps to the citizens of Louisiana as of this morning. Today they are operating 32 points of distribution throughout 20 parishes. Uh, and I want to remind individuals out there, if you want to know where uh, the closest point of distribution is to you and what hours it's going to be operational, please contact your Office of Emergency Preparedness. They have that information. All of this work is being done in coordination uh, with the local Office of Emergency Preparedness. So you can get that contact information for your Office of Emergency Preparedness at getagameplan.org. So we ask you that you would do that. Um, as of this morning, uh, we have uh, more than 10,000 evacuees in non-congregant shelters. And basically, we're talking about hotels. Uh, that's 10,057 evacuees, 43 hotels, 32 of which are in New Orleans. Uh, we also have more than 4,000 evacuees uh, in Houston, I'm sorry, in Texas hotels. Uh, and uh, those are being sponsored by, by the state of Texas, and we really appreciate the help that they're providing to our citizens. Uh, there are still individuals who are determining that their homes are not safe, habitable, and secure and, and need to evacuate and find shelter. And so I want to report that the reception center has moved from Zephyr Field in New Orleans, and we're now going to use the mega shelter in Alexandria as the reception center uh, for individuals to, to register, and we'll, we'll work very hard to find them rooms. Uh, if it is necessary for them to stay at the shelter itself, we, we're going to make that stay just the sh as short as possible because we are trying not to do congregant sheltering because of the 
COVID public health um, emergency that we're, that we're currently working as well. So the reception center is now at the mega shelter in Alexandria. Uh, that's where individuals need to go to be placed in non congregate shelter as rooms become available. Uh, our folks at GOSEP are working around the clock, literally around the clock to identify more hotel rooms and, and get contracts with those hotels. Uh, so you're to go there, don't go to Zephyr Field and don't go straight to a hotel. That's not, that's not gonna work for you. Make sure that you go to the mega shelter in Alexandria. Um, at this time, the Department of Children and Family Services is not issuing hotel vouchers. Uh, instead, they are registering evacuees for placement in hotel rooms where we have space that has been contracted. If you need shelter or information, text LA Shelter to 898 211. LA Shelter to 898 211, and you'll get information. Uh, we want to continue to remind those individuals who've been impacted by Hurricane Laura, they can register for DSNAP now. This is the Snaster SNAP benefits, um, and that way you're already in the system. Uh, when DSNAP becomes available for their communities. Uh, you go to dcfs.la.gov slash dsnap. dcfs.la.gov slash dsnap. Once dsnap opens, uh, this will obviously uh, speed your receipt of these benefits. Uh, DCFS has upgraded its system, so even if you've registered for previous disasters, you do need to register again, unless you are a SNAP beneficiary already. If so, you do not need to register. Disaster benefits will be automatic uh, for you. Uh, we do plan to open DSNAP on September the 10th. Uh, if that date changes, we will, we will certainly let you know. Um, I'm going to uh, ask John Spain to come up here in just a second to talk about the Southwest Louisiana Community Foundation, but I did have a nice conversation today with the CEO of the American Red Cross, Gail McGovern. Uh, they are doing tremendous work in Louisiana. Uh, they are running some small congregant shelters, such as at the Rapides Coliseum, uh, but they are also working the non-congregant shelters, and they're going to be taking over the management and operation of our sheltering uh, at various hotels um, over the coming days, and so they're doing that. They've, they're They've got community, commodity distribution going on um, and, and uh, food service going on. She told me today they're, they're serving 33,000 meals a day in Louisiana. So I do want to encourage people to consider a generous donation to the American Red Cross. And you can go to redcross.org slash donate slash hurricane dash Laura dash donations. Seemed like they could come up with a shorter um, way to do that. But go to redcross.org, and I'm sure you'll, you can find your way to the donation uh, button that, that will uh, come to Laura. But it's redcross.org slash donate slash hurricane dash Laura dash donations. So for more on donate, donating uh, and uh, where it can go and the good that it's done with those donations, I'm going to ask John, Bain, John Spain to come up and give you more details. Thank you very much, Governor. My name is John Spain. I'm the Executive Vice President for the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. And I want to make very, very clear that we're here to raise money for the foundation of Southwest Louisiana. That's Lake Charles. Obviously, their homes are among those that were damaged. Their staff is not capable of doing some of this work. The staff that is is actually housed in our offices in Baton Rouge. So I'm here on behalf of our colleagues from Lake Charles to make an appeal for funds and donations to be made that go back into the community of Southwest Louisiana. Community foundations raise money and put it back almost immediately into those communities, standing up local nonprofits and organization that can do the work before the federal and state money actually flows. There is a gap where private money has to be made available to help people who are hurting in the hours and days immediately after the disaster. We've done this after Katrina, after the 2016 flood, and it's imperative that you listen to your neighbors who are hurting in southwest Louisiana. 
To make a donation to the Community Foundation of Lake Charles, this one is simple. It's one word, foundation, S-W-L-A dot org. S-W-L-A stands for Southwest Louisiana. Foundation, S-W-L-A dot org. If you want to send it to the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, every penny that goes to the Baton Rouge Area Foundation goes to Lake Charles. But the word is foundation, S-W-L-A dot org. We will actually start making grants this afternoon to nonprofits. As I speak here today, the mayor and parish president of Lake Charles are on a link to the members of the Community Foundation of Lake Charles at our offices in Baton Rouge, along with a half dozen nonprofits who are telling us what's going on on the ground and making the case for the money they will need. Please reach out and help your neighbors in this time of need. Please send what you can. I'm pleased to tell you that the Verizon Corporation this morning donated $500,000. Over 1,000 individuals have now donated money in the last 24 hours for a total of almost $300,000 from 1,000 donors. Whether you send a dollar, five dollars, or your company or corporation wants to do something larger, all of these dollars go back into southwest Louisiana to help the people who live there and who need this immediate assistance. So thank you on behalf of that. Be generous. Think about your neighbors. Finally, the word one more time is foundation, S-W-L-A dot org. And Governor, thank you for the time. We appreciate it. Thank you, John. And yesterday I had an opportunity to have a call with uh, the CEO of Chenier, uh, LNG, and they committed half a million dollars to the foundation as well. And so I know that's coming. So I do encourage people to give uh, generously if you're able to do so. Uh, later today, um, in fact, in about 35 minutes, I have a call with the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force. Um, we did receive the most recent state-specific uh, information and recommendations. Um, and as we've told you, we've had some encouraging uh, news of late uh, with respect uh, to COVID in Louisiana. We're certainly doing better than we were a month and, and five and six weeks ago. Um, we are now yellow uh, and not red as, as a state as it relates to cases. We do have about 15 parishes, however, that remain red either for case growth being more than 100 per 100,000 population over seven days or because they have a percent positivity that exceeds uh, 10. Uh, so the 10 percent uh, level is still exceeded in a number of our parishes. But overall, we, we are doing better, and I want to thank the people of Louisiana uh, for that. Uh, the risk, the, the uh, restrictions, the mitigation measures are working uh, here. Uh, and, and I will tell you that uh, certainly just like we've seen progress before and then we, we uh, then spiked again, that can happen, but it won't happen as long as we are, are doing what we're supposed to do, and that is wearing our masks, keeping six feet apart from people not in our immediate household, washing your hands frequently, staying home when you're sick, and reducing your activity. Now, the problem is Hurricane Laura has made all of that more difficult, right? And, and we know that. The other problem is Hurricane Laura has really reduced our ability uh, over the last week or so to do robust community testing. And so at a time when I would want more testing than ever, uh, both to gauge what's happening because of Hurricane Laura, but also because we know we resumed our K through 12 schools, and higher education over the last couple of weeks, we really are at uh, a low point in our community testing. I haven't said that uh, today, and, and uh, they're doing just tremendous work across our state. The National Guard did stand up 17 uh, community testing sites. Uh, but when you get to the numbers uh, that, that, we're, that we're reporting today, you will see that that's the lowest number of test results that we've reported in, in a 24 hour period in a very, very long time, and so we, we don't like that. Um, the White House is still recommending that based on where we are, uh, that we uh, continue with the mass mandate and the closure of bars to on-premises consumption. We are reporting today 324 new COVID cases, 
And again, that's only on 4,029 tests. We were routinely reporting 15,000, 20,000, 25,000 tests a day. We need to get back to those numbers. Uh, we also had 19 new deaths for a total of 4,787. And then also today we're reporting a decline in the number of patients admitted across the state of Louisiana uh, to our hospitals uh, for COVID-19. Um, and so we had had the last two reports with small increases. Today we had a decrease. And so basically over the last four or five days we are flat, uh, which is relatively good news. Uh, for updates about Hurricane Laura response or other important information, text Laura to 67283. We also have a new web page created with updates and resources. It's going to continue to be updated every day. Uh, that website is hurricanelaura.la.gov. Uh, every day we're going to be making uh, some progress. It'll be imperceptible to some, and they won't, they won't uh, feel it, not everybody every day, but we're going to be making progress. But this is going to be a very difficult storm to recover from. It's going to take some time, especially in the most impacted areas of southwest Louisiana, because the damage was so extensive and so catastrophic. But I'm thankful that we have tremendous federal partners and local partners, that we have tremendous uh, private sector entities, nonprofits, the faith-based community, and of course, uh, the state agencies that we've been talking about for a number of days now. Um, so we're going to continue to work hard. Uh, I ask the people to, to, uh, to donate if they can, to help their neighbor, uh, and, and to lift one another up in prayer. And, and with that, I'm going to take a question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am, and, and it's a it's a good question. The question is about FEMA and whether they're going to have enough funds in the disaster relief fund. You know that um, by executive action, the president made uh, 44 billion dollars out of that fund available for lost wage assistance. So the the fund was at 69 billion. And what he said was, we're not going to draw it below 25 billion, so we would have the opportunity to respond to natural disasters. So, so FEMA will have that 25 billion. Now, there are other natural disasters going on right now, principally the fires in California. Uh, but my conversations with the FEMA administrator yesterday led me to believe that we're not going to have any challenges. And of course, we know that Congress is going to have to at least pass a continuing resolution in the near future to keep government open. We know that there's pressure building to pass some more legislation dealing with the coronavirus. So all of those are opportunities for them to pass uh, uh, appropriations uh, for additional funds into the disaster relief fund too. Um, so, but whether they do that or not, and I hope they do, we anticipate that the current fund balance will be sufficient for us here in Louisiana. But we're mindful we're still in hurricane season and additional storms uh, could, could happen. Uh, we're thankful uh, that the weather report today showed that the systems that we've been monitoring, uh, there, none of those are likely to have any impact on Louisiana. I think there might have been a brand new system that came off the coast of Africa today, but that's so far away. Uh, we, we don't know, but uh, given the luck that we've had lately, we shouldn't count against it, right? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, the, the water problems are extremely challenging and widespread. Uh, the good news is that most of our water systems are coming back online because they were knocked off only because they lost power. Uh, and as power is restored, which is happening pretty quickly in, in central and north Louisiana, those systems come back online, subject to a boil advisory, because when water systems lose pressure, um, they no longer uh, uh, can be considered safe without boiling before you would consume uh, the water. Uh, now, as for the remainder, uh, we know that, that both from a power 
uh, perspective. It's going to be longer uh, to try to get those systems up and running. But we also know that the, the destructiveness of the storm that did so much damage to the power infrastructure also damaged the water systems themselves. And quite frankly, we don't know the degree to which it was the storm or, or pre-existing problems uh, that we're dealing with, but there's going to have to be a full assessment uh, of the needs uh, of each water system uh, that, that was damaged and to get those back up and running. But, you know, we've been talking about uh, water infrastructure in Louisiana for a long time now, uh, especially in rural Louisiana. And I'm not going to pretend that our water systems were where we wanted them to be before the, stain, the storm happened. Uh, but, for example, some of these wells and treatment plants and distribution uh, lines were, were already uh, teetering. But others were in pretty good shape until the storm happened and caused damage to the systems, uh, uprooted trees that, that, that uh, ruptured uh, distribution uh, lines and that sort of thing. And, and I don't know the mix. I don't know, you know, so, so we, we've got a, a long way to go um, in order to, to restore the water. I can tell you we're working with our local uh, partners, whether it's a municipally owned system or, or something that's a, it's a water district of a parish or whatever, to try to make sure they have the resources that they need. Uh, principally, they look like generators right now. Uh, but in addition to that, we know that there are some water systems that are going to require extensive work. Uh, and what we're trying to do is get that work done as soon as possible. And it, there are going to be some water systems across the state where they're going to do the bare minimum necessary to get the water operating again as soon as possible and continue to make the permanent repairs uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, but each water system is different, and, and we were engaging a number of contractors with expertise in this area to go in and assist with the assessments and the work, and we'll have more details for you about this later. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, we, yes, we, we've done a lot of work uh, with the K-12 through uh, system, uh, working through uh, Kate Brumley, our superintendent of education, um, as well as with, with uh, Kim Hunter-Reed, the commissioner of higher education, in order to, to work with them on, on ways that we're going to do testing, uh, surveillance testing, and, and uh, so forth, and then the, the capturing of the data and, and, and the reporting of that. Um, and so it's my understanding that, that at the state level, we're going to be uh, putting that data into the reports that we issue. But for the most specific granular type reporting, if you're looking at higher ed, you're going to go to the higher ed systems. And if you're looking at K through 12, you're going to go to the K uh, through 12 systems. Uh, you know, we, we did an awful lot of work, and, and that was, seemed to, to us to be the best arrangement that we could come up with. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, first of all, I appreciate the question. Um, I don't know whether Mayor President Guillory in, in Lafayette is referring to congregant shelters, which we don't want to run congregant shelters either, uh, perhaps for a different reason, but, but if there's no conflict, there's no conflict. We're, we don't want to do congregant shelters any more than is absolutely necessary, which is why I said it, when people report to the mega shelter in Alexandria, we are hoping that we're going to be able to register them and send them to a hotel room right away. If for some reason we can't do that, we want their time in that shelter to be as brief as possible before we can get them into a non-congregant uh, shelter, a, a hotel room. Uh, now, it's also my understanding that when the state of Louisiana attempted to contract with hotels in the Lafayette area for um, non-congregant sheltering for our evacuees, there were not rooms to be had. Um, and so a, as far as I know right now, there, there are not going to be shelters in, in Lafayette one way or, or the other. 
Um, and we do know that it's not just the evacuees looking for hotel rooms right now. Those 17,000 uh, workers uh, coming in here for, for, uh, to restore power, they all need lodging too. And so we're all competing for the same resources. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to decline to, to comment um, on, on whether, you know, I think he's handling things uh, correct or not, uh, because quite frankly, my plate has been full. And I don't know the degree to which he's, he's uh, experienced the issues that, that he referenced uh, when he made those statements um, and so forth. But as it turns out, uh, Lafayette currently is not a candidate for non-congregant sheltering because we're not doing that anywhere. Uh, and it's not a candidate for, I'm sorry, it's not a candidate for congregant sheltering because we're not doing that anywhere. And it's not a candidate for uh, uh, the other sheltering because they just don't have the rooms. I'll come back to you in just a moment. Do you all have a timeline for how long we can house uh, people in, in the hotel? Until the money runs out. No, <laughs> no, so, no so, so there are different programs, and I don't have a female representative here, and, and so I can describe it generally speaking. We think that we can do it on the initial basis of our contracts for about 30 days. But once that's over, we can transition to a TSA program where we would be issuing vouchers. Now, what we're going to try to do in the interim is make sure that the, that the hotels that are currently participating under the contract program will also accept the vouchers so that this is seamless from the perspective of the evacuee. We don't want to be moving uh, people that we're sheltering uh, any more than is absolutely necessary. Uh, but we will, we will transition from the, from the GOSEP uh, issued contract to the TSA voucher, um, and, and we don't really know how long that's going to last, but it, it could last quite a while because the, the options that you have in order to bring people closer to home uh, look like travel trailers, uh, manufactured housing units that you get uh, from FEMA, uh, and then you have to have the infrastructure to support those. So if I had 10,000 today, I can't use them because I don't have power and water and sewer and so forth, um, and so all of this is going to have to be staged. We're going to have a, a lot of different components to our housing plan, uh, but the, I can tell you the, the Blue Roof program is part of this. Uh, our hotels are going to be part of this. Uh, we're going to be looking for apartment buildings that, that maybe have uh, uh, space available. Uh, it, it really is we're going to try to carve together a lot of different options uh, and make it work, uh, but we should be we, sh we should be using, uh, and I believe we will be using, our hotels for, for an extended period of time. And by the way, that's not a bad thing for our hotels because it isn't like we're, we're uh, hitting on all cylinders with tourism and conventions. Uh, and nobody is uh, in COVID. And, and that really sort of is a blessing here because if, if our hotels had been full, I don't know where we would have put these individuals other than in congregant sheltering. And, and I'm nervous as it is about all of the movement that we've had in the state of Louisiana uh, because of our, our preparations for our response to and now our recovery from Hurricane Laura. And, and we, we just we know that every time people are moving around, coming into contact with one another, the transmission of the virus uh, increases. So, so we're really concerned about that. So we'll do the last question here. <laughs> that was your question? Okay, look, uh, thank you. Uh, I do appreciate everyone continuing to cover um, the, the public health emergency with COVID, the natural disaster with Laura. Um, and I'm going to ask the people of Louisiana to continue to do what, what we always do, and that's be good neighbors. Uh, and to make sure that you help out where possible, just do it from six feet away while wearing a mask. Um, and, and let's lift one another up uh, in prayer. And uh, we will be back with you all tomorrow. Um, Christina, what time? We plan to do it at 2 o'clock. Uh, and uh, I will see you then. Thank you.